We need to order, please, at uh, 6.08. Do you need your glasses? Do you need your glasses? Do you want to go? Okay. Do you want to approve the meeting the minutes? No. Nope. <laughs> go right into the public. Go oh, right into the public here. Yeah. Thank yep. you. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lynn Cherry. I'm the superintendent, and I'm, I'm glad to have you all here. Tonight, I'm going to just do a quick uh, visual of the budget. Uh, you all, you may or may not have copies of the budget, but we've always gone through them uh, verbally and showing what the budget is uh, with numbers. But today, I just want to show you some. Um, different ways of looking at the budget. I was asked by the school committee to actually look at the budget a different way, present it a different way, and hopefully this will help bridge some understanding of what it is uh, that we do when we are developing the school budget. So this is us. Superintendent Patty is our director of business services. Darius is the principal. So yeah, everything we do derives from two things. Our district mission statement and our district vision statement. Our mission statement is dynamic learning, building dynamic learning communities, one student, one teacher, one family at a time. Our vision statement is that we are committed to creating vibrant, collaborative, engaging, and inclusive learning communities that empower our students to become successful and self-sufficient participants in society. And you'll see by this group tonight that we're well on the way. This group in the picture is our uh, Schools Match Wits team, the Red Hawk team. And they did win. Does anyone, is anyone here that's in that picture? Yay! So what's the next step for you? Finding out to see what other teams made it and uh, moving on from there. Yay! What's your name? Evelyn. Hi, Evelyn. Good well, job. Yes, we're very Excellent proud, job. just very yeah. proud, because one of the things that we hear a lot about is Frontier is a sports school. We cater to the sports. We're always in the paper because we have such great athletes. But we also have an incredible dramatic arts program. We are having uh, the Wizard of Oz next weekend. Please come Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. We also have a wonderful and outstanding uh, band, strings, and uh, chorus, just outstanding, outstanding, talented students. And we have our brightest of the bright students performing on television at schools and athletes. So everything we do is uh, directly related to this. Uh, as you can see, we have this district strategic plan, which I presented to the school committee last October. And they include three things. Um, instructional practice, these are very broad strokes. We want to continue uh, our strategic plan on ensuring that our students' learning needs are being met through our instructional practice, through our assessment and data analysis. That's another focus of attention uh, this year and next year. And then our special education task force, which I've had people come and discuss that with you. And the, um, these are the initiatives or the action steps that go with the strategic plan. And as you can see that we're really committed on the highest quality instruction available, uh, building students' critical thinking skills, best inclusionary practices through our special ed task force, uh, our professional development days, which allow us to engage in collaboration around personalized learning technology and assessment calibration, which again is what we're, what we're working on. And then again, with the assessment, we're trying to ensure that teachers are monitoring student progress as it happens. A formative, kind of a daily formative assessment, systematic norms to make sure that we are reaching all the kids where they are. So this is essentially where we are. This is why we're all here. This is what it's about. It's not necessarily about dollars and cents. It's about the kids, the kids that come here. And it's also, um, important to realize that the lives of these students and their future lives and what they what they choose to spend their lives doing is directly related to how we are 
educating them and investing our time in them. So, this is just some short data. This is just easy data. Uh, our projected enrollment, right, well, right now we are 623. We may end up with more depending on how many sixth grade students come and how many eighth grade students go to Franklin Tech. So we're roughly in that area. Our students with disabilities are 132 students right now. Our economically disadvantaged students are 30%. So 30% of our total population of students at Frontier Regional School are economically disadvantaged. Our teachers are all highly qualified. We have 56 teaching professionals in the building. We have 24 instructional assistants in the building. We have three administrators, including one curriculum director. We are choicing in 160 students. That's, that's a good number. That's a good number to have students choice in. Choicing out, there's 42 students. Charter school out is 52. So that, that is something to look at. So right now, the budget overview. We are asking for an operating budget of $11,754,404. What we're asking for the town appropriation, the town's appropriation, is $11,048,454. This represents a 3.09 increase over last year, or $331,509. $331,509 over last year. And what it's doing is supporting our contractual salary obligations. It supports an increase in our sewer charges, transportation, central office expenses, health insurance, and technology. Also, please remember that we're getting quite a bit, I'm not positive, I think it's about 700,000, which we'll see in a minute, from school choice bed revolving uh, SPED grant and Title I funds. So right now, the increases and decreases, this is what's driving our budget. The increases are the contractual salary increases, step increases and longevity, 168,000. Sewer charges, 18,000. Technology devices, 25,000. We're all trying to go one-to-one -one for the students to uh, have them all have a device in their hands to, uh, for learning and uh, engaging in research. It's very important. Our health insurance has gone up. It's 109,000. Uh, Medicare tax, 11,000. And then Franklin, Franklin County retirement is 45,000. Some of the decreases. Our spent <laughs> summer services have decreased by 15,000. Our spent tuitions. 23,000, our professional services, 11,000, and our other insurances have decreased by 11,000. We received $705,905 in uh, other funds. Our special education grant gives us 100,581, and that pays for teacher salaries, IA salaries, medical and therapeutic services, psychological services, and clerical support. Our special ed revolving, 119,540, and that's again salaries. Uh, circuit breaker right now is 213,955, and that's for teacher salaries, instructional assistant <coughs> salary, and a specialist salary. School choice gives us 229,225. That pays for classroom teachers, salaries, uh, instructional assistants, and our uh, one guidance counselor salary. And then we have Title I of $42,649 for a classroom teacher salary. So these are our proposed expenditures. We are proposing that the budget we built, instruction is 49% of the budget. Other student services is 8%. That is your transportation, your medical, your um, medical cost and your food service. Administration is 7%. Tuition to other districts is 7%. Our employee benefits 20% and our buildings and facility 9%. Our revenue sources, the four town assessments, 
which include Chapter 70, is 70% 70 of what our budget is. Chapter, oh, I'm sorry, wrong town. Town assessments is 70%. Our Chapter 70 state aid is 24%. Our SPED grant gives us 0.9%. Title I gives us 0.4%. Circuit Breaker, 1.8%. SPED Revolving, 1%. And School Choice is 2%. That's where our money comes from. So when we talk about administration, administration for Frontier Regional is 7% of the budget. 42% of that 7% is building-based leadership and clerical services. Small number. Our district-wide information techno and technology <coughs> and information management, 13%. Those are the people that work on our computers, our infrastructure, where Matt works in the summer. There he is. Uh, Scott Paul, our director, and our, uh, just, they keep our infrastructure going straight really well. Uh, superintendent, business and finance office is 42% of 7%. Our school committee and legal services, 3% of that 7% of the budget. So that's where administration goes. Our instructional costs, which are 49% of the budget. Teachers and department heads, 70% uh, of the money goes to teachers and department heads. Our medical and therapeutic services uh, at 4%, and that is our OT, our PT, and our speech and language. That is not nursing or health related, that's OT and PT. Our guidance and uh, psychologist services are 8% of the instructional budget. Instructional assistance are 10% of the instructional budget. Supplies, materials, technology is 5%. And again, the curriculum and SPED director is 3% of 49% of the budget. When we talk about buildings and facilities, that's 9% of our budget. Maintenance of grounds, buildings, and equipment is 22% of 9% of the budget. Heating and utilities is 36% of our building and facilities budget. Custodian services, 37% of that 9%. And our networking and telecommunications, that's all the infrastructure, the wires, and the telephone bills, the internet, and all of that, is 5%. Uh, other student services, that's 8% of the budget. Regional transport, transportation services is 51% of 8%. Food services is 2%. Athletic and student activities, 33% of the other student services budget. And health services is 14%. And that is our medical, our nurse, and So we in uh, Frontier, we have additional costs lines uh, 5,100, 5,200, and 9,000. Tuitions to other districts, that's our 9,000 line. Out of 20% of the budget, our tuition to other districts is 26%. Uh, employee retirement insurance benefits is 74% of 20% of our budget. So we can't do this without you. You can see the wonderful kids, you can see their enthusiasm, you can look at them and they're, they're uh, this is our middle school singing in the chorus, our kids really getting involved. We have great kids here, we're doing a great job. This school is phenomenal in the kind of education and the quality that these kids receive. We can't do it without you. So what I'm going to do is let Patty go through all the details and then we'll have some questions. Thank you.
I'm going to start us off on page 11 of 54, which is our student and staff data sheet. And this is the only page that changed um, from the previous version. I just updated it for our most current March enrollment. Um, and so at the top, we freeze the October 1st census because that is what our foundation budget uh, is based on. So uh, on October 1st, we had 623 students, 121 of them on IEPs. So projecting down to next year, it looks like we're going to take a jump to 663, um, but that is only if we got every sixth grader in the district, which we know we don't. Um, and also we will lose some eighth graders to the um, Franklin County Tech. I don't know, Darius, if you want to give any more detail about how many you think that Yeah, we lose be. between <clears throat> between 12 and 15 probably each year. So around that, and then if any student chooses a private uh, high school, we get a couple that go there too. So we'll lose probably about 15 okay. is the average. Um, so, and on the right is our staffing. So you, we start with where our staffing was in 2017-18. Um, we were at 108.37 FTEs, and right now we're at 107.27. Um, some of it was just a change in assignments um, for our teachers, and we did reduce one IA in the budget this year because a student left us. Um, on the bottom is our teacher credentials according to um, their columns in their contracts. So we have eight with bachelors, 36 with masters, 10 with masters plus 30, and five with masters plus 45 or a CAGS. On the next page, um, page 12 of 54, this is um, talking about just um, the operating budget that we have the town re that doesn't include the special funds. This is just our town request and how we get from where we are in 18 at 10 million 716 to 945 to the 11 million 48 454. Um, and Dr. Carey alluded to some of them in her presentation. Uh, the steps were 56,956. The 2.5% increase was 106,650. Uh, new longevity payments, 10500 We have an allowance for non-union salary increases of 16135 We had to make some changes in our school choice funding of 65622 and we'll talk about that a little later when we look at our school's choice page. Um, our coaching stipends have gone up 3156 uh, Mentor stipends, it says increase of 3550 it really isn't an increase. It's something that we've had. We've just never budgeted for. So every year I go to Darius and said, where do we budget this? And he says, I don't think we did. So we're budgeting for it this year. Um, and that's re that's a requirement um, if we have a new teacher that they get a uh, mentor for two years, uh, a first, second year. Uh, retirement by max decreased 37978 And our hiring that we did, and. Um, Fiscal 18, we were able to save 56,536 between what we projected um, our new hires to come in and what they did come in at. We do have some small increases in our gas expense, um, our unemployment tax. Uh, we offer to our, uh, to our teachers um, a waiver of, of $1,000 if they don't take our health insurance, and we have one new addition to that. Uh, custodial supplies need to go up 2000 Regional transportation, uh, $5,114. This is the, the FY19 will be the fifth year of our five year contract uh, with Gripco's, and the in, in the contract, the increase is based on the uh, change in the CPI, which um, came out to 1.84% this year. Um, I do want to point out um, that the Franklin County business managers are getting a grant to look at transportation in all of Franklin County. Now, in the past two bids, we have participated with them because there was an opt out. So if we didn't like the, the total bid, we could opt out. Um, this time, it's, there's going to be no opt out. So I, I don't think it would be to our advantage to, to join um, the rest of the Franklin County because we have been using grip goes for as long as Frontier has been here. Uh, and the last time we went out to bid, the difference between him and the next bidder was over $100,000. So I think we will probably uh, be putting out our own bid um, and, and looking and, and not joining that um, 
task force with the Franklin County grant. Um, the Medicare tax is going to go up $11,095 because of the salaries. Central office expense, $15,391. Um, and a lot of that uh, wasn't just the percentage change. I just have to go back to my notes. Um, we added this year a um, district-wide uh, food service director, so that was part of the increase. And also the health and insurance costs. Um, for the central office personnel also increased um, the, the budget. Uh, but we did have some savings, um, uh, close to 30,000, we decreased um, the budget because we were uh, thinking of going, taking our financial software and putting it out in the cloud and that was gonna be a recurring cost and that uh, we finally came to an analysis that it wasn't going to, that wasn't gonna be worth it so we just, Bought a bigger server and we just migrated to it last week and we're having a few minor glitches but so far it's working well and we will be um, adding people the reason we went to the bigger server is because we're finally going to have an online purchase order system which is really going to help with our financial reporting so the, we're going to go from five people using it to like almost 50 people using it so that's why we had to go go bigger go home uh, sewer charges eighteen thousand eight fifty. Uh, previous to this year, we were always charged by the town of Deerfield a minimal um, sewer cost, and now we're going to be charged for our actual sewer cost. Um, we did have uh, an issue with our first billing, which we went to the town of Deerfield, and they agreed with us that our irrigation system needs to be metered because that water isn't running through the sewer. So we will still be getting an increase, but not as much as we initially had a heart attack of. Um, student technology devices, 25,000. This is to maintain. Right now, I think we are fully at one-to-one -one devices for all grades. The $25,000 is to maintain that because these Chromebooks, uh, they, they expire pretty quickly. Uh, we were not, we're not able to update them for software. They break. So this is just to maintain what we already do have. Um, the increase in the Franklin County Retirement Assessment, I'm sure all of the towns have seen this large increase, 45128 and Mr. Kowacki says it's because people are just living longer, which I guess is good news. Uh, increase in health insurance, $109,364. Uh, our life insurance did drop 970 Copier costs, 1373 um, and that, oh, that was the other part of the central office. Uh, since we moved here, we had some savings. The high, both the high school and central office went out together, and we've got a one solution print system. Um, and so the high school saving money, the central office is saving money, um, and it was a it was a big rollout. And our teachers, it was going to be a big change because we got rid of a lot of desktops, and we and we're focusing more to uh, everybody going to copiers, and the teachers were a little shaky but it's rolled out I think actually pretty great and we're all saving some money. Um, mon uh, our monitor uh, stipends that is for monitors on our special education buses uh, can decrease about $30,000. Um, decrease in technology costs um, that's a $34,81 that's a change in the allocation of some softwares. Other insurances, um, we're saving $11,037, and that's mostly um, good news in our workers' comp. Uh, it's based on a four-year average of utilization, and we are now at like four low years. Our two top years have gone, and so we're able to save about $11,000 there. Um, decrease in professional services, 11555 This was an account that we were looking at, and I think this was partially a fee that we were paying to the bonding company while we had the bond, and the money's just been sitting there. So when we looked every year, the money wasn't being used, so we decided we would cut that from the budget. Uh, SPED summer services, we're going to decrease 15688 and our SPED tuitions are going to go down 23590 uh, for a net change of 331509 So pages 13 to through about page 24 is just the byline detail of what I've gone at what I just gave you a summary of so you can look at that it gives you the actual spent in F17 um, what our budget is in 18 and what we're proposing for 19 
starting on page 25, that's when we start looking at our other sources of funding. Um, so that is, uh, Dr. Carey in her presentation told you, um, like if you look at page 26, uh, that our SPED grant is going to provide 41991 um, and that is actually a secretarial service there. And then 27, you see this, this I, I like these pages because it gives us a true cost. If you look at our classroom teachers on just the um, town assessment budget, it looks like we're paying 2918 But if you look at this page, you can see our, the, our total teacher cost is 3175 So I think these are good pages to look at because it gives you um, a good idea of what we're totally spending. And um, just so that you know that th this format of uh, presentation exactly resembles the end of the year report that we have to report to DESI. So when you look at that report, it should line up pretty much, pretty much as like our budget does. Um, and we've spent a good piece of time getting it that way. And I think it's easier to read. And I hope you guys agree. Um, so. If you go to the end of that section, which is on page 36, you'll see that our total budget for FY19 will be 11,754,404. 93.9% of that coming from town assessment, chapter 70, uh, and the E&D monies. Uh, 1.95 coming from school choice, 1.82 coming from circuit breaker, 102 from SPED revolving, SPED grant 0.86, and Title I 0.36. And um, every year, our Title I money just keeps decreasing, decreasing, and decreasing. And I don't see that changing. Uh, page 37 of 54. This is um, the school choice and charter. In FY17 was the first year that when we got the governor's budget, they predicted that we would have more choice and charter out than we were bringing in, and we had to budget some charter tuition. That never came to fruition. And I, I didn't mean to rhyme that. Um, so they are again projecting that for 19. They're saying that we're, go that we're gonna be short 35,672. Um, so, because 17, we didn't expect to get any money, we're starting with a very healthy balance of 466,843. And of that, we're spending about 142,000 this year. Our projected um, net for 18 would be 17,000, so we add that on there. So when you saw the 65,000 added on the front page, we had to cut those from the school choice budget to make room for this shortfall because we can't not budget the shortfall. These are the numbers we're given. I'm sure, I, I really doubt we're, we're gonna be in an upside down position, but I, I, I can't, from a conservative perspective, I, I have to go with what they're projecting. Um, page 38 is our circuit breaker. And the circuit breaker, we're getting hit on two ends and, and, and it's not a bad thing, the circuit breaker kicks in when you spend four times the state average of, of a SPED education, then you get a partial SPED uh, reimbursement. So two things are happening. One, for the past six years that I have been in this district, we have had no K to six out of district placements. They've all been seven through 12 placements. So these are, so our SPED director has done an enormous job of building programs at the elementary level to take to maintain our children in our schools. We've used the circuit breaker money because we've had a lot of tuitions out kids to build capacity here at Frontier to now bring those kids up. So we're losing circuit breaker money because our out of district kit tuitions are decreasing because children are one aging out and two we're also doing um instead of once they hit 18 and they've met their graduation requirements we're still responsible till they're 22. so we're now using career transition programs instead of keeping them in private placements which is also saving us some money so the problem is we're our, our circuit breaker money is down a and then b the legislature keeps cutting the percentage that they're gonna that they're gonna refund us but we need these positions. So they're gonna to have to migrate to the budget as, as they come off here. They're not positions we can cut. These are positions that we created at the high school to maintain these children in our districts. 
Um, and just to give you an example, um, the May Center, uh, which is um, a school for kids with autism in, in West Springfield, we were budgeting 110000 but they have such good business, they had to move to a larger location, and OSD gave them, a, 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 gave them an increase, and we budgeted one hundred and ten. and now one student costs $116,000. So maintaining them in our own, in our own school is, is, is what's best for them and what's best for us financially. But again, you'll see our budget increasing in the coming years as that money decreases. Page 39 is our excess and deficiency. It was certified by DOR on January 8th at 352567 our audit um, identified an, a problem that we're having on our balance sheet with our insurance withholding and we had hoped to get it corrected before the audit ended but we were not able to so they recommend our auditors are recommending that we put sixty thousand dollars aside to correct the insurance issue and the school committee voted to again use half of what was left to apply to the assessments which was one hundred and forty six thousand two hundred and eighty four dollars leaving us 146,283. Um, pages 40 and 41. This is our school choice receiving report. And it's comparing where we ended up in June. We had 163, we saw 163 students. They stayed 14966 FTEs, which means some of them didn't stay the full year. Uh, starting uh, our year this year, in December, when we reported, we had 160 kids. Um, and if you look on the right-hand column, you can see the majority of these 160 kids come from Greenfield and from Montague. Between those two schools, that's 96 kids of, of the 160 that we're, that we're receiving. If you look on page 41, I don't want you to think that I have nutty math. I just want to explain to you how I do this. I'm comparing Instead of saying grade seven to grade seven, I'm comparing my FY17 grade seven to my FY18 eighth graders. So I had 30 kids last year. I still have 30 kids. I didn't lose any of those kids. So that, but if you look at the eighth graders, I had 28 and I only have 23 ninth graders. So we lost five kids there. So don't look at the math across, look diagonal. On um, page 42 and 43, this is our school choice sending report. And we are right now down one from last year. There's 42 students going out um, that will cost $311,714. And most of them are going to Hatfield and to Northampton. And again, uh, you'll see the breakdown by grade on page 43. Uh, page 44 is the charter and unfortunately we last year we had 46 kids going out this year we have 52 so that's going to cost us 974,625 and most of them are going to Four Rivers and uh, PVPA and you can see the grades broken down on page 45 what I have done there um, I was asked to add this page to the budget um, on the left, you'll see the number of kids per town that are going out, that are choicing or chartering out. So total choice and charter for Conway is 21 students, Deerfield 36, Sunderland 21, Waitley 16 for a total of the 94 kids. On the right hand side is the cost per child per town. So if you look at this, Conway is sending out $301,850 worth of tuition, yet the way we allocate according to the uh, regional agreement, they only pay $204,013. So um, you can see where we have two winners and two losers. So if we were to talk about this and try to change this in the charter, we'd have two, vo we'd have two votes for it and two votes <coughs> against it. But again, this isn't something that existed when, we, when the regional was put together, so it's something that the agreement is silent towards. Um, the next section is our assessment, and on page 47, that is the five-year uh, enrollment average. 
and 2012 drops out and 2017 comes in. So dropping out 2012, we lost 492 students and we're only bringing in 461. So the um, assessment is really changing for Conway. They're gonna go from 15.86% to 16.22. Deerfield is going to have a small increase from 48.57 to 48.64. Sunderland is going to have a small decrease from 23.73 to 23.70. And Waitley is going to go from 11.84 to 11.44. Is that our name or is that name? Um, the next page 48 is a look at our um, revenues. And the assessments to the town are going to increase 4.61% or $349,615. Chapter 70, we received an increase of $11,100, which was $20 per student. Excess and deficiency, um, the amount is down $10,766. Regional transportation, we're hoping will increase by about $30,691. And the revolving transportation, there is no credit this year uh, for 19 because we exceeded um, we didn't get as much money as we thought in 17 that, that, that we thought uh, we would. Uh, below are the preliminary minimum contributions set by the state, um, which is uh, increasing 237,171. And then on page 49, that is the actual page that comes uh, from the state to show how each uh, town changes. Um, and Deerfield looks like it's up six students uh, from the pre previous year, and I, and I think that's what um, the 138,467 uh, comes from. But um, an interesting question uh, came up today um, because they have not. When you when we look at the formula for the minimum contribution, it's the um, equalized property values and they're still using the 2015 income tax returns to set um to set uh, the the the, pro, uh, the community wealth factor and one of the questions that i don't know why I, i'll tell you why it finally dawned on me is because i'm trying to uh, put all our transportation on a on a, a routing software when they what they tell me they do is that the dor takes all the revenue from a zip code and that's how they decide the property's wealth. Well, half of Waitley's zip code is, is Deerfield. So is, is, is Waitley income getting reported in Deerfield's calculation? And who do we call to check on that? And Conway's the same way because Conway, some of my Conway residents have Shelburne Falls at, um, zip codes. Williamsburg. In Williamsburg. So, does the DO is the DOR aware of that? And and do we need to, you know, do, does somebody need to call and ask that question? Uh, are you asking that as a question to us? Yeah, I'm, I'm throwing sure. it out there because so, it was just I, something that you know. This is the first time I've been in a regional. I was talking to a lady named Beth Bandy, who's chair of the selectmen at Charlemont. She runs an organization called the Small Town Summit. They've been working very hard with Adam Hines, who's <coughs> writing legislation to try to fix. A whole lot of these kinds of problems. Buckland Shelburne has the same. Time, just call the Buckland yeah. Shelburne is the worst. Yeah. Yeah. All of all of the restaurant revenue from that's in Buckland goes to Shelburne because Buckland has a Shelburne zip code, <laughs> and so the, so the, the Buckland charges a two percent meals and lodging or whatever it is tax. It all goes to Shelburne. They can't get it reversed. No. So, I mean, I think that's something that we, you know, and again, I will try to, uh, I'll try to find out from Desi who at DOR I can speak to. Because, I mean, the two towns that it affects, Conway and um, Deerfield, are the two that are at Target. Which is kind of, you know, an, an anomaly there. So, I think they think you're richer than you are. Um, page 50 is yeah. the assessments. So, you'll look at the operating assessments. Um, they're up 4.29. The transportation's up 25.13, and that's because we didn't have the credit. So combined, um, it's 4.61. So um, if we look at Conway's, uh, their their combined assessment in 18 was a million two. It's going to be a million three. 
Uh, Deerfield is going to go up 196,503. Sunderland's going to go up 65,452, and Waitley's going to decrease 4,549 dollars. Uh, page 51 is the um, how we we start with the budget less the less the um, region uh, the regional transportation we deduct the chapter 78 we deduct the free cash used and then we take your minimum contributions and the balance two million nine fourteen four oh seven is allocated by those percentages we saw on that first five-year enrollment page and then you see the difference between the edit reform um, calculation and the assessment uh, agreement. And again, if we wanted to try and change this, there would be two towns that would benefit and two towns that wouldn't. Uh, on 19 is um, the regional transportation. Uh, if you look down below, uh, the, uh, the cherry sheet is saying that we're going to get 156,818. I think that's optimistic. I took the um, end of year report and I'm taking 60% of that and predicting that we're going to get more in line of 138,368. Um, so that is what uh, that less the total cost of 283,76 is what is being assessed for a total of 144,000. And I'm off a dollar. I'm going to have to fix my dollar rounding on that. And then page 53 is just uh, me making sure that for every budget dollar I need that we have a funding source. So it's just balancing the funding sources. And page 54 is the summary of all the allocation methods that we use in this budget. I'm sweating. If you, if you guys have a question or... Raise your hand, say who you are, and Patty or Lynn or okay. Patty or Lynn will answer it. <laughs> I hope. Patty, would you go back through that again? I think I missed something. Yeah. <laughs> are you serious? <laughs> <laughs> no. I'm sweating bullets. <laughs> what part? Start with page one. <laughs> uh, yes, is it open contribution or policy? There is no OPEB, um, and that's something I'm going to uh, be talking to the school committee of because um, the town of Sunderland saying that they made it a budget line item in their budget, and um, I don't know that if we can. So I'm going to be talking to school committee and getting our attorney's opinion on that because, again, OPEB didn't exist when the regional agreement was. Uh, so it, uh, our regional agreement doesn't address choice and charter. It doesn't address capital improvements, and it doesn't address OPEB. But I don't know if OPEB is one of those things that we can just put in a, in a budget line item, but there is no obligation. There's, no, there's nothing in here for OPEB. The school committee did, three years ago, approve $100,000 from um, excess and deficiency, and we do have a trust set up. Uh, and that money's on deposit with Bartholomew and company. And um, just so you know, um, one of the reasons, the main reasons we went with Bartholomew is because three, oh, I think three, maybe all four towns have money deposited with Bartholomew and they're giving us the benefit of our members' towns' collective points. So we're getting more, better interest because you're also invested in the Bartholomew Fund. Tom Hutchison, Conway, can you talk a little bit more about capital planning and uh, maybe uh, a fund from year to year for um, projects that may come up? Well, if that, well, I'm going to let Darius talk about what this committee is doing, but if we, in order to do what you're saying, Tom, is we would need to change the, the regional agreement. But um, I'm going to let Darius speak a little bit about because you you all came to our presentation and the subcommittee was created. So Darius, do you have an update on that? that I, you I could... feel all in favor of changing the regional agreement for that. Yeah, I mean basically right now, so we have a uh, a building subcommittee, which is you know, could also be considered a capital um, improvement committee. Um, looking at we you know Frontier right now as a. a there's a few issues of just being 20 years old. And so we're trying to figure out how to fund the capital improvements since there is no um, language within the regional agreement on how to address that. Um, and so we are working with FERCOG 
and talking about possibly creating a capitalization stabilization account um, through um, Frontier itself and then talking about how to fund it through the towns. So we're right now learning about all the different options um, and I think I, you know, more, I'll have a more formal report on options for the school committee. Um, and that committee right now is so that those people at home watching is a select board member from each of the four towns and four members of the regional school committee make up that committee. So, um, you know, so that's where we're at right now. So we're hoping to come up with some sort of, um, you know, five to 10 year plan to address the um, capital improvement needs of the building. Um, and it may also include um, some borrowing up front to deal with some of the issues that are uh, too expensive to go through uh, a kind of a stabilization. We would take time to build up. We have some issues with our track. It's a large price and some other um, smaller issues, but need to be um, addressed more immediate than building up in a stabilization account. So that's overall what if that answers your question. So hopefully we'll have more to Great. more to come. We've had about we've had three meetings since um, January. And so we have another meeting in a couple of weeks. So we're meeting about twice a month. And hopefully our goal is to have this thing wrapped up in presentable form by December so that we can get the next um, round of town meetings next spring with, about, with a plan. So Thank you. now that I've said it, now we really have to keep that time. <laughs> <laughs> I should have said that. Okay. Are you cataloging, Dave Pierce Sunderland, are you cataloging items that need to be addressed separately <coughs> by the regional agreement? Because it seems like uh, we're going to need, uh, as town member towns, to get together and convene some kind of uh, meeting to address things that clearly, you know, weren't around, issues that weren't around then. And I don't think we can expect a 20-plus year old agreement to sit there and not change. I mean, we've got to adapt. Times change. And we have to expect to occasionally revisit the agreement and make amendments and changes as necessary. So are you guys cataloging those? Because I think that would help. I, I know what my three are. Uh, okay. I, I, I don't know. Uh, I mean, these are the three. The committee that we've, I've discussed with this committee is the OPEB, the school, the choice and charter out, and the capital. And those some, seem to some be of the them three are language issues. They have like the, the budget yeah. process. The, date, right. the dates and the times, they're all they're all whacked out because right. they, yeah. they're 50 years old. And they don't go along with, with the release of the governor's budget. Right. And, right. and so they're asking us to have a budget done before the governor's released his budget. So Well, we were in the same position with the yeah. towns. That's, yeah. Right. And they, they, one of the things, too, is that the agreement as it stands now says that for any uh, amendment to it or any alteration to it, all four towns have to vote in favor of that alteration. So... Um, yep. Yeah, but I, I, I think at some point we're going to have to suck it up yep. and deal with it because yeah. it's like... Well, who's going to suck it up? <laughs> we're all going to have to. We gotta, it's we easy gotta, for you to say, Bill's been here a long time, and, and there's well, been a couple people in the back row have been here a few t few years too, so I've only been here 20 years, but it's... <laughs> well, we can't expect it to... We can't expect an agreement that was made before any of the certain issues here ever even existed. We have to expect them to get together occasionally and modify it to, to meet you know, what's going on. In a good year, you can get three towns to talk about it. This year, you could get two times to talk about it. The other two won't show up. Well, I think you did. Same thing. Uh, three dates we need, but that doesn't mean we can't. Just because no, you're it's right. difficult Absolutely doesn't right. mean we should shy away from it. Yeah. On the contrary, yeah. we need to. We got to do it. I mean, otherwise, we're just going to keep pushing the can, kicking the can down the road, and not the and, and right. And the problems are just going to keep getting worse and worse. Probably the year we have an extra million kicking around, we'd be the year to do it, but yeah. well, I don't foresee an extra that will million. Never, that, and that's more to my point. That's never going to happen. So we've got to address it at some point. Yeah. Anybody else? Alan Singer Conway, a couple of questions. Maybe you're probably just addressed to you, Patty. Uh, looks like we're losing $18,742 of student in school choice based on information on page 44. Where are we? Uh, What's the current rate for the state for uh, high school kids for uh, school choice? It's 5000 So, 5, um, So the only, uh, it's still 5000 but if you look on this chart, I was asked this question before, why are some of our school choice kids not at, at 5000 It's because they're receiving SPED services. So we get $5,000 per student, um, and we pay $5,000 per student at the at Frontier for each student, plus if they get special ed, there's a SPED increment. I could, another question would be, of the 
0.09% increase. Approximately what were, how much would be the result of salary increases under collective bargaining? Um, it's hard to recite. Let's come up full well, uh, 1.57 is is what the total salary change is, but if I take out, um, let me just take out, uh, do we want to keep the, you want to add the non-union in or just the union? Union <coughs> I have a phobia about doing math in public, and it's about 1.62 percent. But that's a little misleading because that's all, it's higher than that. Because what's represented on this page is only the salaries that we're charging here. So there's other salaries in school choice and in the sped revolving and everything else, and I'd have to add all of them in totality. Um, actually, you know what? I can I can tell you what that is. I can go to my handy dandy sheet. So when you look at the um, the charts or the pie the pie graphs that um, are included in this document, those do include when we look at the the one that talks about instruction, that does include all of the teachers from all funding sources, all of the different personnel that work in the building. So these do include that. But yes, the impact on the budget is different because the funding sources cover a lot of our grants and extra funds cover our, our personnel. So if I look at our steps, the increase and in changes in degrees, the total cost for all funds is $196,458. So almost $200,000. Anybody else have a question? Uh, Bruce Hunter Deerfield. Uh, I didn't notice there was any funding for resource officers, officer. Or yes, um, the school committee voted to, uh, to so it's not a change because it was 15,103 last year and it's 15,103. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. I, I, I can tell you what page if you give me yeah. one moment. We uh, voted that last, uh, last, week. last if, meeting. Uh, if you look on page 21 of 54, Right on the top, um, school security, 3600 It was $15,700, and we budgeted the $15,700 again uh, this year. So it's under contract services? Yes, because we're, we're not paying the actual salary. We, we receive a bill from the Deerfield Police Department. Okay. Right, of Thank you. Anybody else have a question? Hi. Question or comment, whichever you want. Uh, I will ask a question later. Uh, if I look at, excuse me, Let's see if I can find it. Page 53. Funding sources, assessments to town, increase of 4.61%. Let me explain where the towns get their money from, essentially, and whether it's Deerfield, in my case, or Conway, Waitley, or Sunder. It's basically the same. We get it from taxes, and taxes. Bill, you and I are on this committee in 1980 when Prop 2 and a half was passed. And since then, you calculate what you can collect in taxes, by essentially by multiplying what you got last year by 2.5%. And you can add a little bit to that uh, for a couple of reasons, but it doesn't really amount to a whole lot. Call it three percent. So our taxes can go up no more than three percent, excluding debt service, excluding two and a half override. Uh, I don't know if anybody has done a two and a half override. Conway did it what, 25 years ago, 30 years ago? Try doing it again today. 
We have two other sources. We have what we call local receipts, automobile excise tax, those kinds of things. That typically goes up 2 3% if we're lucky. And, it's and then state aid. And cyclical. Yeah, and then state aid. You know what happens to state aid, just look at what you're having. So at most, we can afford, we, the four towns individually, can afford roughly a 3% increase. So here's my question. It's your budget, where do we get the money from to fund your budget? 4.6% increase. Well, first of all, the we and the you, I don't, I don't like it's, the, the it's use us. of the terminology because they're your kids that were well, educated. Well, it's us. It's the we, right. we is everybody here, collectively. I'm not separating out. And I'm we, not separating and out. this budget is not adding any new initiatives. What I'm asking you is we can increase our budget 3%. That's what we've got for dollars. That's the increase in the total dollars coming into the town. How do we increase it four and a half percent? I don't know. Well, how are we supposed to eat $150,000 of, of Franklin County retirement and health insurance? And I mean, and we're all experiencing that. We, we've got the same thing you've got. We got that too. So we, we feel your pain because it's the same pain. It's a little sharper here. So Deerfield's budget last year, a little less than $15 million total. That's $450,000 increase at best. What was the increase to Deerfield in your budget? $496,000. you have taken every cent that we've got, or you're asking to us to contribute. $196,503. One ninety-six. One ninety six. Two hundred thousand. Take the take the elementary school. And I don't know what that number is. I'm not trying to sit here it, it, the, and, and argue with you. I understand the situation. But when I add up all of the increases, they add up to more than four and a half four hundred and fifty thousand bucks, which is the total number of dollars we got in additional revenues. That's the issue. It's been the issue. And, and it's a problem, and I don't have an answer, to be honest with you. Um, if I can speak to that in, in somewhat general terms, uh, yes, that, that's, that's absolutely a, a, uh, a correct perception about the, the weight of the school budget in, in terms of the, the town budget. And there are other departments in town that might want to grow more or have more programs or be able to fund things more fully. I would simply suggest that um, rather than trying to solve that problem within our communities, uh, that we look at the history of state and federal funding and uh, the resources that are available and uh, spend our energy advocating at the state and federal levels for changes in priorities. Yeah. I have to say I agree 100%. I, um, one, one of the things, I mean, since I've been a selectman in Deerfield, when I, I remember f I was around the first time we went and protested, and it was like 36% of the cost of a student was paid for by the state. We're now down to 24%, 22%, somewhere in there, that range. That's ridiculous. It hasn't kept up. So we, we and the charter, the charter, I mean, a million dollars is going out from our kids here to other schools. I mean, that is just gross. I think, you know, it's raiding our, our, our education here. We could use another extra million here. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think what we have to do is, as town, we have to really write a letter and, and, and if you can give us some kind of template as to what the history is and what the trends are, that we can all send letters from the school committees and the towns, and we and we start advocating some more because we, we just have to do something. The trends, like Skip was talking about, 
I mean, it's not sustainable. It's a broken record we have every single year. People want to fund schools. We want good schools. That's not the question. The question is where do we get the money? We have less money every year, and I mean, and everything goes up more than two and a half percent. So what we have to do is we have to figure out something different, and when we have to advocate. And I, I think we just, you know, um, I know Trevor has been really participatory in the small um, rural communities. Um, group and we, we've got to keep doing this kind of thing and rally to get more money because it, it's the trend is that the state is paying less and less and we're paying out more and more to these charter schools and school choice and it, it's just I mean it's it, we can't keep going. It's hard enough, Carolyn, for them to for us to get them to hear our voice now and we're losing some of our best voices. I know, it, like uh, Steve Cooley. Well, it, 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 which exacerbates you know. It, well, that's Peter Colcott, yes. I mean, John Sybeck. So we're going to have rookies. You need to even speak the, even louder. The answer's in this back row here. And, and, yeah. And that's, I mean, our, we, that's our future. And we, we, need, we need them to get involved in local government, and school committees, and um, advocate to your, to your representatives. Um, you have a big voice, and you, you, can, you can change things. It's going to be our younger yeah. generations that are going to make the change. And just because it is... You know, it is tough to do it, and we are going through a transition with our delegation. It means we just can't stop. We can't give up. We have to keep complaining. And I don't think it's just Franklin County. It, it is it's all of Western Mass. I mean, it's all west of Worcester, it's it's like we don't exist. Well, I mean, the, the town of Weston well. can afford to pay four times what their net school spending is, and yet they're still getting Chapter 78. Why? Why? Uh, well, they're lobbyists. So what we have to do is we have to connect with the people on the Cape because the people on the Cape are in the same, you know, boat as we are, and we have to and we have to make a voice and we have to explain. <coughs> we need we need you as a group to to give us a template of of the information, the trending, and, and a letter that we need to send, and then we, as our four towns, we need to start working on that because this, there is. We have to do something. You just can't give up because that's that's the problem. They want us to go away, and you just can't go away. Well, what they want us to do too, Carolyn, is you know that they're not going to help us do anything except regionalize. Yep. Then they'll help us. Well, but I, that's I know a their few agenda. years ago, I know a few years ago we had a committee that I was really excited about, and I attended a lot of meetings, and it was you know what what are we doing? Where where are we going? And we had talked about doing a magnet school and, and doing different things. And, and it sort of went by the wayside because, of course, there was no money to fund anything. So I, I kind of think that we need to start generating that again because we, 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 are, we are not sustainable for the long term. Are we going to make it in the next few years? Yes. But what, what, what's going to happen in five or ten years? You know, all of us have been here for a long time. So what are we doing for the kids? you know, in the next five or ten years when the budgets are going to look a lot worse than they are now because mm -hmm. the trajectory is not, is bad. Mm -hmm. And so we need to figure out what we're going to do and we need to reimagine some of this stuff that what, what the kids are doing now with technology and stuff, that's changed from where, you know, 20 years ago when my kids were in school. So, you know, we need to create and think out of the box and whatever and, and go and get apply for a pilot program to do whatever. I don't know, but I don't know the answer because I'm not an educator, but we do, we need to band together and try to figure out what we're going to do to keep this school a good school for five or six, ten years down the line. Because it, 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 we're only going to get more difficult every year. Um, Carolyn, I was at a, a Franklin County Business Manager's meeting today, um, March 24th at GCC. There is a, um, the, rural schools. Uh, a rural schools, the, yeah. the sustainability yep. of the rural yep. schools that will be happening between 9 and 1230 at GCC. Um, and I think probably as many uh, people that can attend that should be there to see um, uh, what this presentation is about and see if there's anything we can take from it to help us. Right. Well, forward. like I said, we just, you know, people, we just need to band together and we're all in this together. And so instead of you know, fighting about every dollar. We need to be fighting for more dollars, and, and that means we have to do a little bit of effort and change 
it's not how we're thinking, you know, the next two or three years, I think. So I know I was planning to attend. I know Trevor was planning to attend. Maybe there's more people that can commit. And then, you know, we can bring some ideas together and start another committee. I, I People don't like to do stuff by committees, but I feel like we've got to get together and do things. And, uh, you know, we have less of a pie every year. Or, or the pie increases by such an, a small amount, and, then, and our needs keep increasing more and more. And it just is very depressing <laughs> every year, budget year. It, it, it never gets better. So, so I, I, I couldn't agree more, Carolyn. And um, I, uh, the superintendents across the state were asked yeah, uh, yesterday, I sent a letter to um, the uh, president and the chairwoman of the Senate Ways and Means Committee. And the request was um, essentially this letter, the template, this letter was uh, about the uh, the act of modernization of the foundation budget for the 21st century. And it essentially talks about Chapter 70 uh, over the past 25 years. Uh, it has dropped nearly 9% when adjusted for inflation. And as a result, we're seeing larger classes, uh, fewer wraparound services, and a reduction or elimination of access to foreign language foreign languages, arts, extracurricular activities, despite our constitutional responsibility to cherish our educational system. So in response to these years of advocacy, these uh, students and uh, parents and districts and educators have um, established that the Foundation Review, Budget Review Commission to recommend improvements. The bill directly reflects those bipartisan and unanimous recommendations and will modernize our foundation budget with regard to special education, low-income students, English learner, and employee and retiree health care costs, which is a big piece. So uh, the, the consensus around this bill hasn't been seen in decades, which is why it is co-sponsored by every member of the Senate. And this letter was in it was to ask them to urge them to make it as, as soon as possible to ensure that our investment in our schools matches our expectations of our schools. So this is going to the House Ways and Means Committee in Boston. <coughs> and so there is a lot of, um, how do you say, um, groundswell under, you know, the support is starting because we are, we're, our chapter 70 is going down and our costs are going up. Last Friday, Tom Hutchinson and I uh, attended a luncheon uh, with the, uh, all of the representatives, the senators and the representatives of Massachusetts. We sat with someone from Paul Hines' office and Senator... Mark, uh, Representative Mark. Yeah. So we sat with them and... Uh, listen to senators from around the state discuss, yes, Western Massachusetts does get left kind of in the dust, and yes, these issues are real for everyone, and we, we do need to do something. So this coming Friday, I'm going to Massachusetts Association of Regional Schools legislate, legislative breakfast to talk more about what is happening at the state level particularly for the small regional schools, the western Massachusetts schools, as well as our rural schools. So we are trying to do something, but when I get templates like this, when I get letters requesting that I sign them and send them as a superintendent, I will certainly pass them along to you as well as constituents of uh, Massachusetts who we, we really do need to do something. And uh, I think they're starting to hear our voice. Uh, I thought that was pretty clear when we were there on uh, Friday. Um, but I don't know how much it's going to take to really see action. We've got to try. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Carroll. You have the balance of your economy. Two things. First, it would be really helpful if you could uh, pry from the uh, destiny and or the Department of Revenue the formulae that are used to calculate the allocations. Mm -hmm. I'd like to see what the assumptions are. Uh, I, I think it would be really insightful and would give me certainly an area in the 
wrap my head around how it all works. And the other thought would be to share, uh, Dr. Kerry, when you meet next week with uh, the Donahue Institute projects that the population of Franklin County over the next decade is going to decline by 1%. We have an increasingly aging population of people who are in lower and fixed incomes. And the rate of increase in the budgets every year far exceeds the call off, cold off for Social Security. It's really, really hurting people. Anybody else have a question? I do. Uh, Phil Walker, Deerfield. Question about the budget. I haven't seen it, but uh, just kind of listening. Is there a line in the budget for marketing? Yeah, we've been hearing that. We've been hearing that from the, the small towns about marketing ourselves, and um, we're. It, 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 we're a public school that's a new avenue for us I mean marketing is usually in your private schools they have admissions uh, and recruiters we don't have that in our budgets and to add it, there's so many things that we do need that we haven't added to our budget I don't know that that would be principal Modesto's I mean it's been an interesting point I, mean, I think what Phil brought that up a couple, a couple of meetings ago about should we hire someone to market you know, if you get two kids to go to a charter school, it'll pay for itself. Um, it's an interesting idea, you know. The, the reason I bring that up is because th this is a fine school, and we're doing great things here in, in the school, but the perception of families or parents or kids who go somewhere else and bring the money that we pay for them to go somewhere else is they don't know that this is a fine school. So they... If they knew that this was the best place for them, or at least thought it was, then the money wouldn't be traveling out, out the door, and our budget deficit, uh, you know, like where, where are we gonna come up with a half a million dollars um, might be kind of fixed. Okay. Uh, to tag on to that, um, when the, uh, yes, on two vote was going on for charter school expansion. Um, the collaborative got together and and started a Twitter feed and a Facebook feed for you know our public schools. And so it was very much on that line is to to advocate and to advertise all the great things that are ha you know happening. And not everybody's on Twitter or Facebook, but if you if you hook into those, um, it's great. Every day, every day, there's multiple um, articles that come up from schools all around our Western Mass area in the Franklin and Hampshire County of all the good things the students are doing, the trips they're taking, and um, plays that are going on, or teachers um, getting awards. And so they're trying, you know, to help us out in, in that avenue, and, it, and it's good to see. But I, I agree, we, we, need to, we need to advertise what we're doing, and we need to think outside the box and what we're doing, and meet with our curriculum directors, and, and think about the future of education and where we're going. And, and change that because our, our kids are, are, are exiting these doors into a vastly different world than, than, than I even graduated, and that was only 1989, but it's just completely different. Um, every five years it's changed, and the technology the kids are using is completely different. Um, you know, the memorization does not need to be there. They have, they have a Google in their pocket, you know, with, with the world. Uh, so there's there's some changes. You still need a lot of that, those skills, but, um, so anyways, I agree with, with the advertising. We need to find a way to do that. Yeah, Matt Carlson, Deerfield, a senior here. Um, but those who want to speak to the marketing that was brought up is that the National Honor Society is starting a new thing. We're holding information sessions for sixth grade parents at the at least Conway Elementary School as we're just starting to try to get more people to come to Frontier instead of charter schools. And uh, we're hopefully going to try to expand that to the four schools, but Conway actually reached out to us uh, to do a little 20-minute PowerPoint and talk about all the cool stuff that we do at Frontier. So, you know, that's one of the free things that we're doing for marketing. That's great. That's awesome. Can you, can you do that at the elementary school? Yeah, Conway Elementary. Yeah, but can you do that at your family? I mean, that's what we're going to try to do. Yeah, we haven't talked to Seriously. I made, I made the same point. We had the same discussion at the Sunderland when you guys came to our Sunderland meeting. And I think this is a good example. I know. We need marketing, unquestionably, especially if we're being forced to compete against charter schools and other things. But this is a good example of, because I know 
where are we going to find the money for the budget? But there are some creative ways I think that we can probably look at it. I think the first thing we need to do is take a step in the direction of acknowledging the need for it. And then we can, once you do that, then we can figure out ways to maybe do some marketing that's very minimal cost. But we definitely need to, to do that. And, and kind of tying back to a point, solving these problems with education, the funding and everything, we obviously have to advocate more at the state level, but it's also not just, there's no one simple solution no, because there, there are a lot of components to it. But we all have stuff. FCAT funding. And so if we could advocate, you know, take some of our FCAT funding and fund the Honor Society to do a promotional. There, there's I a mean, lot of things there, that we can Why can we do that? I mean, that's not any new money. That's money that we all have. And Carolyn, so, that's not the only thing we did. Um, last week, uh, Mac Sherrill took our band to all four elementary schools. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. And, and, and to show these kids the, the that, music lessons you're taking, this is what it, this is what it's going to turn into. But that's the kind of thing that we have to do. But I mean, but a step right now that we can take is to fund the Honor Society through FCAT, which we all have money. In our, in our accounts to do that. And if we can do that and get them to the elementary schools now, this spring, we might be able to eat into that million dollars that we're shelling out. Mm -hmm. And that will have a huge impact for next year. It might be great if we could invite the parents on the days that they go to come in and yeah. right. watch it as well. But we have realtors, realtors in the area too, have vested interest in making sure our school system can provide them out there. Well, that's, that's but that's why if well, you see, fund it through an get. FCAT thing, well, you can run it through everybody. Because I mean, one of the things that, if for nothing else, to market the reasons why we need to keep this up is, what's the first thing you ask when you're looking at buying a house? What, what, well, what's the school district like? Because that drives property values. And for no other reason than think of your property value if you're not going to think of anything else. But also, I like to thank, I like to thank uh, Darius because we had asked for the, uh, the list of where students will be where they were accepted because that's not, and I thanks for sending that list because I think that was one of the other things that we discussed in Sunderland is, as far as getting information out is where are students being accepted to as far as colleges? Now where they actually go may vary, but I think that's an important thing and if we can market that too. Because we're, right now we're forced to compete, so we're gonna have to figure out ways to compete. And You're putting an awful lot of pressure on them at school's math witch team. <laughs> I, I think they do all right by themselves. They do fine. I, I do know that last year a DVD was made by these students um, through FCAT, I believe, or through uh, Mr. Murphy. I'm not sure. But that was brought to the elementary schools and shown in the sixth grade classrooms. And I'm not sure if the director of guidance did that again this year. But there was a DVD made of all the great stuff going on here, a montage. And, yeah, I mean, we, the director of guidance went and visited every school, talked about, this is way back, we started the process in October. Um, you know, we're right in the midst of tomorrow was supposed to be a coffee and conversation with me, which is going to probably be canceled. Um, and, um, you know, we, I do multiple of those, we do information nights. I mean, the difficulty is the numbers you're looking at each year is very small, okay? And so when you lose four families, in the transition from elementary to high school to charter schools. And they're adding to charters that they've already been attending where it's like there's different entry points. Um, it's very difficult because people choose sometimes because there is choice, that the grass is greener. They feel that they have the best knowledge for where their child should go. Um, our big push the last few years has been make sure if you're going to make decisions, you have all the information. You know, um, some people are not impressed with for your college numbers. You know, they're looking for, you know, they're not looking for the size of classroom, really, they're looking for size of school, where they're looking for something that they have, um, they've made up their head. So I, I agree that marketing, there's a lot. I mean, I'm spending more time on this than I think any principal has done 10 years ago. Um, and, you know, there's only so much that there, I do, there's a part of me that nods yes when we say, can we have a marketing person? Because there's only so much there's only so much bandwidth I can do on this bus, but the amount of money it could save is, is also huge. But I don't know, you know, having, I do exit interviews with all the principals regarding, I go through the entire list of who didn't come, and we go through why. Where did they go and why? And a lot of them are not, they are not within the control of the persuasive, that the principal's sending, who know the families quite well, you know, that there's, you know, why they decided elsewhere. There may be a few in there, and those are the ones we may have to target, but, 
So I guess I was thinking out loud right there that maybe that's the next step, um, is looking at targeting those families and understanding their, their decisions, and then that's how we can market around that. But, so I wrote, it, I wrote that down a moment ago, so but that's it probably the enthusiasm. Right. And, and, and I think by building the enthusiasm and actually having a program that can be funded on a year to year basis or an idea that's really great that you can go out and do outreach, then I think you are you have to have a positive impact. And it might only be one or two and initially, but maybe it will be three or four the next year or whatever. And I mean the cost to send kids out to charter schools <coughs> is so out of line of what we get for school choice. That's the problem. And that's the thing that we have to fight and argue about with on the state level. But Right now, what can we do right now? I, I, I mean, I think this is a fantastic idea, and it should be funded through our FCAP money. I just wanted to also remind everyone, we are bringing, bringing in 160 kids from other districts. And one of our highest sending districts advertises on the radio once a week. And still, we're getting 160 kids and most of them, or a good amount of them, come from that district. So we, we are reaching people. We are doing something right. People do the secrets out that we're the best. Uh, I think we also need to look at the positive. Everything you're saying is valid, and it is so worthwhile. But we're also doing something right. And I think rather than asking people why they're leaving, I think we should talk to our kids that are coming in, that are our school choice kids coming in, and why did you choose us? And then go out with that message. We have students that come because when people choose to go out, that's their choice. And if they're not ready to tell us, especially in the elementary, they say in the elementary, I was at a town the other night, and they said, well, why are these kids not coming here? I can't call up a five-year-old's mother and say, why are you not sending your kid to our school? I mean, it, you can't harass people. You can't, you can't. I mean, if the kid has never, if the child has never come to our school, we, it's very hard to say that. But the kids that come in, those are the ones we should be targeting and taking that message out to more kids. That was a double-edged sword because if you want to start trying to do things like bond and try to keep the revenue base steady, you can budget better. When you want to go out and raise money, we talked about the bonding issue here really hard to get a good rating and keep up a good financial state. <coughs> you have that kind of a wild card in the budget. It makes it really hard. The Finance Committee Chair of Conway, I'm sure speaking for the towns here, you know, you have that kind of a wild card, school choice in and out, it just makes the planning process that much more arduous. That's a lot of volatility. Like I've been telling our town officials in Waitley many, many years ago, and we used to have $50,000 in that rainy day fund for school choice and we didn't spend it for anything but the kids. Now, you look at what we're spending all the school choice for. We're doing it for the kids, but we're not buying anything extra for the kids. Like we bought computers back then. We're paying salaries. Salaries, salaries, salaries. Every single year we're paying salaries. Instead of buying some more computers for the kids or something, we're paying salaries, and that's not we, what we planned years ago with school choice. We wanted to buy more computers and stuff like that. But it's, but thank God for school choice. Like I tell our people in Waitley for all these years, when they say, well, you know, we, we used to have 25000 for a rainy day. Now we're spending next year's money to pay for that budget instead of having a rainy day fund. I'd Anybody like else? to just Matt, put I'm in sorry. that frontier teachers are fantastic, even though we're paying salaries. Uh, uh, Matt, you have something else? Yeah, this is a little while ago. I was just going to ask what um, you would um, propose that the, the, the funding towards that program would do. Because I, I think that this is kind of a rhetorical question that I'm trying to make a point with, is that some of these things don't need to be like funded. Like the NHS, um, as being a member, member of the National Honor Society, you have to do certain volunteer things. That's actually a new um, provision and keep retaining your membership is that you have to actually participate in these certain fundraisers or a certain number of fundraisers. And I know that uh, Mr. Murphy, who does a wonderful job, he's the outreach director for FCAT, and he tries to get all the, the water volunteer student participation in FCAT um, 
my deal with film stuff like that. I remember like five That's five years ago when I was in eighth grade, I was filming things like that, volunteer. So I don't, maybe that could be part of the problem is that we're spending money, or maybe we can have volunteer that benefits the students. Oh, I'm not saying not a volunteer, because obviously this is a wonderful volunteer a year. But uh, to document it, you can um, use FCAT money to document it, you can pay for the program or whatever program you need to, to make it promoted and get it out to the communities and make it into a format that, you know, whether it's you know, this or whatever. How, however you are feeling like you want to distribute it, it would come under the purview of the FCAT funding, I would think. Did it under that kind of well like I think like he's saying I don't know that you need I think you've got the resources already you don't even necessarily have to spend money I think we need to think but if we allocate maybe a couple thousand dollars I can't see your minimum, minimal enough yeah. and turn over some of the marketing to people who know how to market on social media that's that's right. that, you know like the students but that, but that's that's funny, you could fund some of these things. but that's only a tiny part of the well, I, I guess my, my point was kind of that it doesn't take a, a bunch of line item to upload a video to YouTube and put the link on your website. It's kind of the point I'm trying to make is that if you don't have the money, it's not something that we can't do. It's, it's going to be more things. Keith, I have a question for, for Berlin or for any of this like persons from any of the towns now that we have it here. The, uh, we have to go to all town meetings. We have to meet with all the select boards about how we're using town funds. Uh, I know the representatives from the tech schools also have to come out to the town meetings. Now the schools are spent, or I'm sorry, the towns are spending significant town funds on charter schools. What kind of reporting do you get from the charter schools about their use of town tax dollars? Zero. See, I think that's a significant, that is, there's, that, that goes back, that's taxation that's without absolutely. representation. Well, that's, 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 that's a significant that's, aspect that's, as well. And that's one of the problems that we need to, this is why it's a, there's, when you talk about funding, there's a number of problems there. Charter schools is a very, and I've been trying to work with Steve Kulik to find out, first off, let's look at what we originally legislated to allow charter schools to do. Because supposedly, they were supposed to bring all sorts of wonderful ideas back to us. Where are they? Where are the ideas? And we have to be better. And, and that's, that's a big issue, is we have representation here for how we're spending our money. There's zero representation. And then to go back, and this is just on the choice, we get $5,000 for a student. It cost us, a, Trevor and I were looking, $17,000 to educate the student. So we're $12,000 in the hole just on choice students. And then you look at what we're paying for charter schools. And they're also not held to the same, well, I, I'm not going to go out because this is really a whole other thing, but I think we really need to, because they're not held to the same standards, right? And that's, that's a whole other and their their rate is part of their ca the calculation of their rate is based on our per pupil cost. Right, right. And you look at who's the biggest um, taker of those students is Four Rivers, and you can make a very valid argument for for like the PVPA and the Chinese Immersion School mm -hmm. because they do a very specific niche product, essentially like that. But the other school is basically just trying to clone what we're doing. And if you look at the money for the last choice budget. The vast majority of those dollars to fund that vote came from outside of the state interests, who were corporations who have a lot of vested interests in getting more charter schools because it's a profit center for them. They they are required to send us their financial statements, yes. and we sometimes randomly we will get one in the mail, but nothing on a consistent basis, and only their audited financial statement right. is like the only thing we get. Budget process. Right. Um, I just want to point out that the uh, Pioneer Valley, uh, the board review of commissioner decision to decline Pioneer Valley Chinese Emergent Schools expansion request. It was we sent letters last spring to deny it. They wanted I think 400 extra seats from what they have. That was denied, but now they have another hearing on March 27th. And representatives of the school will be present to uh, appeal and respond to their specific questions and uh, definitely public comment submitted during the department's review process as well as new comments submitted uh, is, you know, <coughs> welcome. If we're going to do something, if you'd like to do something, March 16th is the deadline. 
if you would like me to come up with us, something. If you could send us a letter, <coughs> a template letter so that we could all send out, that would be fine. Certainly. Send it to the town administrators, Carolyn? Yes. 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 And then we will, you know, craft the off the template and, and send comments. Great. By March 16th. Yeah. We need, we need to know where to send it. Do we have do we have any more questions about the budget from Frontier? We're going to close the hearing at 739. 739.